All right. Happy Friday afternoon, everybody. Sunny Friday afternoon, if you're here in Southern California. And, um, and this is a really exciting opportunity for us to highlight one of our own. Um, so thank you so much for being here. I'm going to go ahead and, and start the introductions. Um, and uh, so this is the Health Equity Translational Social Science Seminar Series along with SEML. Um, so we love this partnership and we've had just a series of amazing speakers um, and uh, same thing for today. So um, first um, I'm going to introduce to you Dr. Erica Bath, who is the Director of Child Forensic Services, Associate Professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Associate Chair for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at the Jane and Terry Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Health Behavior at UCLA. She's board certified in child and adolescent, adult and forensic psychiatry. Dr. Bath has had a longstanding interest in healthcare disparities, minority and community mental health with particular interest in addiction and trauma within the special populations of juvenile justice and foster care youth. Dr. Bath has dedicated her time to working with vulnerable populations and their families and, and consults regularly with the court system. Her portfolio of research includes funding from the NIH, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, PCORI, Los Angeles County Department of Probation, which includes researching the efficacy of short-term family-based interventions for youth involved in the delinquency system, as well as the trajectories of commercially sexually exploited girls. Dr. Bath obtained her undergrad degree from UC Berkeley and her medical degree from Howard University College of Medicine and completed her child psychiatry and forensic training at NYU School of Medicine where she was on faculty prior to fortunately joining us at UCLA. And, um, and then on a personal note, even though I've only like seen Dr. Bath in three dimensions, I think twice in my entire life, I have had the opportunity to interact with her in forums like this and others. And for those of you who don't know her, she's just an extraordinary human. Um, so I hope you do have an opportunity to get to know her more. And I'm really excited to be here for her talk. And along with Dr. Bath is, is Sarah Godoy, who is an MSW doctor of PhD doctor, doctoral student at UNC Chapel Hill. And uh, she uh, is a graduate research assistant, a Royster fellow at, at UNC um, School of Social Work. Her area of research focuses on youth and young adults impacted by commercial sexual exploitation in the juvenile justice and child welfare systems and their intersection with healthcare, social services, and technology. Sarah was a research associate and co-investigator of the pilot study, My Body, My Choice, focused on reproductive and sexual health among systems-involved youth with histories of commercial sexual exploitation at UCLA. She was lecturer in the Department of Social Welfare at UCLA and she's conducted preliminary research in the red light district of Tijuana, Mexico, practice social work with women and children in the brothels of Old Delhi, India's red light district. She has published peer reviewed articles, research reports and magazine articles, including five articles in Forbes magazine about commercial sex sexual exploitation. In 2017, Sarah was named number 20 on the top 100 human trafficking and slavery influence leaders. Sarah earned her master's degree in social welfare at UCLA. So it's a welcome back to you. And thanks so much also for being here with us, Sarah. And um, the two of you, please take it away. Thank you, Rochelle, Dr. Dicker. Okay. Okay, so we are gonna, everyone can see my screen okay? Great. Um, so it's really um, thrilling to be here with Sarah, um, who is um, a mentee and a friend and colleague. And just um, to those who have the positionality to mentor uh, the next generation of science, 
to make sure you bring them along when you have opportunities like these to present because I wouldn't be here without Sarah. So I'm really thrilled to be in the space together. Um, these are some of my disclosures, but more importantly, I've been um, opening most talks thinking about disclosures in terms of uh, positionality. So thinking about uh, my positionality on the axes of power, privilege, and oppression. And so in reflection of that, um, I identify as a black cisgender heterosexual woman. I'm a mother to a teen daughter. I'm a daughter of two black physician activists. Um, I've been working in child welfare and juvenile justice systems since 2003. I've been doing work related to commercial sexual exploitation since 2014. Um, as Dr. Dicker pointed out, I'm a HBCU grad and I like to try to aspire to be a good trouble champion in the spirit of the late John Lewis. And I'll let Sarah give her uh, positionality disclosures. Hi all, so my name is Sarah. I identify as Latinx or Latina. I am cisgender, hetero woman, able-bodied. I'm a cat mom, <laughs> um, which is very important to note. Uh, first generation college student, a PhD student and a Royster fellow in a prestigious university and a top program in social work. Um, and I began in the anti-sex trafficking fields in 2014. And I'm particularly interested in community engaged strategies. And this is our lab. So it makes sense to really uh, spotlight our lab. Um, we are really committed to conducting community driven innovative research that aims to reduce inequities and increase access and linkage to health and social services for youth impacted by commercial sexual exploitation. We take a multidisciplinary approach by partnering with both service providers and community members to create lasting uh, solutions and really with lived experience experts. So we really try to center their experiences, their perspectives as part of our um, approach. And we're committed to serving a group of resilient young people through the development and dissemination of meaningful empirical data that meets their self-identified needs. So our objectives for today are to understand the reproductive health needs of justice and child welfare involve youth with histories of commercial sexual exploitation when we'll use the acronym CSE. And we're going to recognize the importance of intersectionality frameworks and CBPR community-based participatory research approaches to addressing these use uh, reproductive and sexual health needs. We're gonna acknowledge limitations of the current landscape with regards to the reproductive uh, health interventions for this population and learn about community engaged approaches to address their health inequities, as well as participatory informatics approaches. So one um, important framework I think that's critical to uh, sort of foreground us is the notion of intersectionality. And this is an advanced audience here. So people are probably familiar with intersectionality, but it's so critical when thinking about our population. Um, and another way of understanding intersectionality is as layers of discrimination or marginalization and how these layers um, sort of layer upon each other to potentiate uh, risk and structural vulnerability. And so as Audre Lorde says, there's no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not uh, list single issue live. But the term uh, intersectionality was developed by legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw to reflect uh, these sort of overlapping systems of oppression and marginalization. So we work with youth who have histories of commercial sexual exploitation. So it's important to define that for folks because people may not be um, uh, aware of that term. And really it means inducing a minor, um, anyone age 17 or below into performing sexual acts for anything of value. So it doesn't need to necessarily be money. It could be basic needs. Um, it could be getting their nails done, anything like that. And the terminology is really important to highlight because there's no such thing as a child prostitute. So we never use that term, um, but you'll see different terms in the literature, child sex trafficking, commercial sexual exploitation of children of youth or domestic minors sex trafficking. But it's important to note that people are not acronyms. And so we really try to use a person first language when referring to this problem. 
Um, and in terms of the scope of the problem, it's really thought to be underestimated. We know uh, worldwide um, from an international labor organization that's around 4.8 million youth, but it's really important to highlight how overall commercial sexual exploitation often exists behind do closed doors. It's very clandestine activity. It depends on how people are trafficked, which people are trafficked by using technology, um, back pages. And so some of the estimates are really, you know, grossly underestimated. But the U Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention recently estimated that hundreds of thousands of youth are at risk for exploitation every year. And it's also important to highlight that gangs in particular have recognized that this is a high profit, low risk work um, and estimated that one girl, for example, can yield 500 to $10,000 per night, depending on the venue. And so it's really thought to be big business. Um, one recent study found that it was a $31.2 billion industry. This was over a decade ago. Um, and so that notion has been growing. And California has several of the FBI identified hotspots where LA is actually the number one hotspot that's thought to be the number one hotspot nationally. So when we think about risk and protective factors for commercial sexual exploitation, we like to uh, think about a social ecological model. And it really emphasizes, again, that risk is not a single issue, but moves across these various structures um, and causes um, structural vulnerabilities related to a uh, concept of structural intersectionality. And so, Youth who are impacted by commercial sexual exploitation really tend to be in these categories. And you can see the intersectionality at play. And in, in addition, it's really important to highlight that they are disproportionately youth who are in the child welfare system. So several studies have found any range from 50 to 98% of CSE impacted youth have been involved in child welfare and also have high rates of child maltreatment. We like to think about risk factors across these different domains. And so the one thing I do want to highlight is the importance of naming racism and discrimination. And so most studies of commercially sexually exploited youth do not really spotlight racism, but racism structures who experiences many of these inequities. So who experiences concentrated poverty, uh, justice, child welfare involvement, all of which increase uh, marginalization and structural uh, intersectional risk for commercial sexual exploitation. And then I would be remiss if I didn't highlight the work of Dr. Hansen and Metzl in thinking about structural competency, because uh, when we're thinking about uh, commercial sexual exploitation, we also have to think about structural drivers. And taking that a bit further, applying both structural competency and intersectionality is the concept of structural intersectionalism. And so many um, the, uh, studies looking at uh, intersectionality just focus on single level factors. And it's important to sort of aggregate these in addition to thinking about larger uh, features such as economics, a uh, legal system and education. And so this has been emerging way to think about the need to synthesize intersectional and structural approaches. So what are the health needs of youth with histories of commercial sexual exploitation and those who uh, are both in the juvenile justice and child welfare system? Um, they have significant needs and these range across mental health, substance use and reproductive health. They have um, high rates of unplanned and unintended pregnancies, sexually transmitted infection, uh, violence related industry, uh, injuries, and there's a strong uh, connection between uh, youth who have experiences of physical and sexual abuse, maltreatment, and delinquency. And so for the purposes of this talk, we're really going to focus on reproductive needs and risk. Um, and we're disaggregating it by thinking about youth who are justice involved and youth who are child welfare involved. And it's important to note the overlap and flow uh, between the two populations. So thinking about pregnancy risk, justice involved youth um, have high rates of pregnancy and really bear um, the brunt of STI and pregnancy burden out of adolescent populations. By age 19, more than half of young women in the juvenile justice system have experience of pregnancy. 
Um, 18 to 30% of male adolescents report they have fathered a child. And many of this behavior is occurring in the context of severe trauma. For child welfare populations, girls in foster care are really especially high risk for having a pregnancy. Um, more than 40% of teen mothers in LA County alone have reported abuse and neglect and 20% had substantiated maltreatment reports. But most populations, teen pregnancy is going down except for in uh, child welfare and juvenile justice. Thinking about um, pregnancy, we also have to think about sexual risk taking behavior. So youth who are justice involved have high reproductive needs. Their rates of chlamydia and gonorrhea are three to, three to two times higher, um, as well as rates of STIs. And so it's really critical to sort of begin thinking about sexual risk and really addressing it. Recommendations from the National Child Traumatic Stress Network that came out in 2015 really highlighted the importance of developing gender-specific trauma-informed uh, care for this population and recognizing also that they really need to be decriminalized. Historically, youth with histories of commercial sexual exploitation would be incarcerated and punished. And that has shifted with the things of safe harbor legislation and other uh, changes, but it's really critical to actually focus on their multimodal uh, health needs, including reproductive needs. And so our lab has really tried to do this over the years. Um, initially, we began in uh, late 2014, 2015, and we really wanted to get a sense of what youth wanted uh, very rarely do people ask uh, the population they're working with how they, what their perspectives are on barriers and facilitators to engaging in care, and particularly youth who are um, marginalized in this way. And so that was one of the things that we wanted to do first. And so we're kind of in this phase of our work, and, um, but it's been iterative. So I'm going to highlight just a couple of the studies to sort of set us up for the uh, My Body, My Choice. So one of the things we did was we partnered with um, the STAR Court, which is, stands for Succeeding Through Achievement and Resilience. It's one of the oldest uh, uh, sex trafficking courts and few uh, trafficking courts in the country for youth. And the judge was really concerned about pregnancy rates. She said, I don't know what's happening, but I feel like all the girls are getting pregnant. And so we did a case file review and we found that she was right. <laughs> This ended up being one of the largest study of pregnancy outcomes of, of among girls in the US impacted by commercial sexual exploitation. And pregnancy wasn't systematically collected either. And so the, the results we had are likely an underestimate, but what we found was that um, pregnancy was frequent. About a third of the girls had been pregnant. 18% had multiple pregnancies. And a lot of those pregnancies occurred over the course of court involvement over half. And so it really signaled to us an opportunity for the court to provide more services. Historically, for justice involved and child welfare involved populations, the focus is on mental health and substance use and not on reproductive health, even though there's a clear nexus between the two. Um, the second one, another study that we did was actually wanting to hear from the youth, you know, what their um, navigation of reproductive health services was like, um, you know, what did they feel like were barriers and facilitators. There's a myth that youth um, were not, you know, engaging in safe sex and that wasn't, you know, necessarily true. And so we really wanted to get their perspectives and really tried to identify needs. And so many actually had shared misconceptions, particularly about hormonal um, methods. And it was clear that they really weren't getting access to consistent education. Um, and they recommended to us the importance of actually um, that they wanted you know, sexual health education. They wanted it via social media outreach. They wanted higher availability of services um, and also having medical necessities in the field. Many times when youth um, are being in the process of being exploited, they don't have access to um, tampons and pads and other hygiene supplies. So they wanted all of that coupled together. And they really wanted um, to center the voices of lived experience experts as part of uh, their treatment engagement. And so this work then led us to um, 
developing this conceptual model called fierce autonomy. Um, and we really wanted to recognize um, the strong drive for youth affected by commercial sexual exploitation to be primary drivers as decision makers in their care. Um, many people give this population a sort of negative uh, judgmental um, view in thinking that they're difficult, that they have an attitude. And we really felt that that was dehumanizing, doesn't recognize the structures that take away their own personal agency and also doesn't recognize their resilience. And so we really try to be strength-based and person first and think about the ways in which they engage in care um, from a uh, shared decision-making uh, perspective, but also from an autonomous per perspective. Many times their agency is taken away by their caseworker in the child welfare system or their attorney who changes. And so this tension between mandatory obligation to participate in court mandated care or child welfare mandated care really um, doesn't sort of recognize their autonomy. And so this is how we sort of decided to reframe it. And then we really wanted to think about how to leverage digital uh, technologies. And so digital technologies historically are being used all around the country and all around the world, um, but really haven't been meaningfully applied to justice populations or child welfare populations, sadly. And so one of the things that we, you know, my colleagues and I wanted to pitch is that we need to actually decrease the digital divide and bring the technology that we use every day for everything we do to these populations and to their families so they can self-navigate um, and have access to care. And it's already was clear to us that this was happening, that youth were communicating with their probation staff, with their child welfare staff, but it just wasn't in an organized, um, structured fashion. So we actually queried girls about this and we wanted to get the sense of, you know, if we were to design an M Health tool, like, would you be interested? And they said, yes. So we, we sort of framed this as like what we want, why we want it, how we want it, and concerns and considerations. But the main thing that you said is that they really wanted um, a survivor uh, related content, um, information from lived experience experts. They really wanted on-demand content on reproductive and general health and personal hygiene, but they also had identities beyond their identity of being exploited. And so that was really important as well is that they are more than their histories of exploitation and they wanted you know, information about recipes or childcare tips. And so we took this into the work that we started to do with My Body and My Choice. And this is just also highlighting how um, they really wanted you know, survivor stories to be centered. Um, we also want to make sure to anchor our work within policies, right, that are happening. And so um, one, two, like, important initiatives that happened while we were uh, in the field were the California Healthy Youth Act, as well as the Reproductive Wellness Act in foster care. And so that really um, mandated that all youth should be receiving uh, reproductive health education. And Really, the SB 89, specifically around foster care youth, was important because of the itinerant nature of youth who are in foster care system. They may not be accessing their reproductive health services in school. And so really it puts the, um, it highlights how it needs to happen regardless of whether they're in foster care or not and that someone needs to be doing it. And so in that we ended up partnering with Los Angeles uh, Reproductive Health Equity Project who really developed the pilot uh, groundwork for Making Proud Choices, a reproductive health education curriculum. And this is the curriculum that we ended up adapting with our survivor leaders, our community advisory board, and our youth advisory board. And so the original curriculum was medically um, accurate and fun. However, it didn't involve lived experience uh, experts, nor did it center them. They weren't co-leads. Um, it didn't have a harm reduction approach. It really didn't take into consideration those who've had histories of sexual trauma. So it wasn't trauma informed. Uh, we also um, made sure to make it LGBTQ uh, responsive and informed and also added substance use psychoeducation. That was largely missing. And we know that at the nexus of sexual trauma 
and mental health is substance use. And so many times part of the risk-taking behavior is taking a sexual risk uh, under the influence. And with that, I will turn it to Sarah. Thank you. So now we will discuss the development, implementation, select findings and lessons learned from My Body, My Choice, which is a comprehensive sexual and reprodu reproductive health intervention that addresses the specific needs of system-involved youth with histories of exploitation. Next slide. So we wanted to apply a community-based participatory research or CBPR approach, um, which is for many of us, we know it's a research paradigm that's grounded in social action and critical consciousness theories. And it underscores the role of participatory research in com mediating community change across multiple levels of influence. So it really posits that shared power and decision-making is instrumental in producing collective action within communities. And it's kind of a move away from the traditional evidence-based praxis of um, academic community research that is conducted on or for marginalized communities, but not necessarily with uh, marginalized communities. And so using this approach, we integrated um, these kind of key principles, these eight key principles, and um, therefore, you know, really wanted to address uh, sexual and reproductive health related needs and recommendations at the center of uh, what we did for this study. Next slide. So the overall goal of using this approach was to really inform the adaptation of Making Proud Choices, the evidence-based sexual health curriculum. Notably, um, that intervention, that curriculum is very well known. Um, it has been validated with many populations including um, populations that majority identify as black and so black youth. Uh, however, we noticed that in being validated and used in evidence-based with this population, uh, girls were still at the fringes. So it was primarily with boys who were system involved. And so some of the content we realized it really needed to be tailored to meet the specific needs of girls within systems who also have the uh, history of exploitation. So we wanted to use CBPR also to determine the feasibility and acceptability of using mobile technology to supplement the curriculum, which I'll talk about later and I'll give some examples. Um, we also wanted to develop a sexual health intervention that was really, you know, it packaged the curriculum the adapted evidence-based curriculum, as well as the mobile health technology um, to meet their specific needs and then to implement My Body, My Choice, which is the sexual health intervention. So we can see here, uh, we developed a community advisory board uh, simultaneously with a youth advisory board. So we had two parallel boards where we invited folks that were lived experience experts, which is actually a term that we asked folks, typically in the anti-sex trafficking field, folks are called uh, survivor leaders. If you have a history of exploitation and now you've gone on to mentor younger generations who have been exploited. And so we were sitting in a meeting, one of our very first meetings with about four uh, lived experience experts. And we said, how would we like, do you like that term? How would you like to be called? And so they were like, well, what about lived experience experts? And so moving forward, um, I might use the acronym LEEs, but you know, it's really the language that they wanted to hear that we've adopted since then. So the community advisory board included seven LEEs who were, uh, four of which were really part of like from start to finish um, in the adaptation process. It also included 26 stakeholders. Um, and as many folks who know, when you do community engaged research, you know, folks have com competing demands. And so some people might pop in for a, a meeting or two, some people it's hard to really stay engaged. And so we tried to create an environment where we had a core group um, of lived experience experts and then also invited stakeholders from, uh, and I'll talk about the collaboration in a moment, but um, we wanted to ensure that the intervention at a minimum 
was medically accurate, it was trauma-informed, it was person-centered. Um, and so that was really some of the goals for uh, the CAB. For the YAG, we brought together uh, seven youth in particular, and I'll go into detail about the demographics of the, the Youth Advisory Board, but the overarching goal was really to ensure that the intervention was age appropriate, it was youth friendly, the language resonated with the youth. Um, we wanted to kind of test the feasibility of internet-based group activities since everything pivoted from in-person to digital, um, and we wanted to examine the content acceptability uh, of the intervention in a space where youth can freely give their feedback and we can make revisions in real time. Um, and so next we have the community advisory board. We had nine sessions in total with these stakeholders um, from June 2019 to October 2020. And so here um, we had really a multiracial ethnic group of predominantly women in their 20s and 30s um, who participated. And they, the lived experience experts, as I mentioned, had histories of mentoring youth. Some were still in positions where they mentored youth. Um, so they were really on the ground, kind of already doing the work. Some folks had experience develop, developing curricula as well. Um, so it was really kind of a good blend. And we also integrated the perspectives of stakeholders from entities on the ground serving the youth, uh, including Altamed, healthcare professionals who were actually implementing the uh, original Making Proud Choices curriculum uh, with youth. We had folks from the uh, Department of Probation who were part of the Child Trafficking Unit, DCFS, uh, Department of Children and Family Services, who again were those responding to commercial sexual exploitation. And so it was really this collaborative effort folks on the ground who know the population all the way from, you know, frontline professionals giving direct service, supervisors and administrative folks as well. Next slide, please. So here are just a few lessons learned from uh, our time with the CAB. We realized that before engagement, when you engage folks with lived experience, it's actually really important to assess their emotional capacity because there are, there are sensitive topics that we're discussing, we're talking about sexual and reproductive health, and we're talking quite literally about, you know, sex and, and there's trauma that can come up. And so there was one instance where um, we had a model penis that was part of the original curriculum and someone had an adverse reaction. They had seen the model penis. This was an adult and they felt like, you know, wait, maybe I'm, I'm not really ready to kind of dive in and do the work and have some of these conversations because seeing the model penis and, you know, doing the um, condom demonstration brought up kind of emotions and feelings that, that really made them kind of take a step back. And so um, it's really important to do a brief assessment prior um, to really clearly document what the ask is and what the expectations are to be really clear about the research methods and you know, kind of taking down those barriers between researcher and community members that make it really difficult to understand what intervention research is, what pilot studies are. Um, and so ensuring that they have kind of an accurate understanding of the purpose of the study um, and not just assuming that they know or understand um, kind of the, the research perspectives. Um, during engagement, identifying a core team was really critical for cohesion to ensure that as people were coming in and out, folks still felt a sense of, sense of safety and that they felt comfortable with those in the room. Um, and after engagement, I think one of the things that's been really nice is to ensure that they're part of the dissemination process. So right now we are co-authoring a lessons learned paper with a lived in lived experience expert and also a community partner. Um, and we opened up the opportunity and asked folks who was interested and um, created a space where we can all kind of co-author together. Next slide. So the Youth Advisory Board was a group of 18 to 10, 20 year old young women um, with histories of exploitation. Here, it was really a partnership with the community-based agency Saving Innocence that we were able to develop the Youth Advisory Board. Uh, 
notably, you know, the community based agencies are often gatekeepers to accessing this population. And because we had a long standing history of working directly with them, um, it enabled us to access potential participants. And all of these youth notably had received services at some point through this organization, but they had also successfully completed a leadership program. And so it dovetailed really nicely with the work that they were doing on the ground to then put them in positions where they could take leadership roles and uh, influence the research that was being conducted. Just a couple findings, which I, I'm gonna blaze over, but we did have six meetings in total with the Youth Advisory Board. Um, and all of these meetings were pivoted to uh, virtual because of the pandemic. Um, in any given meeting, there was between four and seven youth, and then it was between July and October of 2020. Um, and these are just some of the lessons that we learned. Um, you know, youth preferred group settings that were large, but they still wanted a sense of intimacy. So they wanted to meet new people um, and create, kind of use the opportunity to also cultivate the friendships and relationships with other folks that have lived experience. Um, and so, you know, that really said to us, we had to create opportunities to build rapport. Um, so maybe 30 minutes at the very beginning of every session to just talk and check in and not do anything necessarily research related, um, but knowing that, you know, we need to create a little extra time for these folks. Um, and so here I just share a quote. Uh, someone said in regards to kind of needing reminders because of the competing demands that these youth have. And often there's so many com competing demands and no necessary, there's not necessarily like an app or a centralized location where all of their justice or child welfare or healthcare system involvement are meeting together to help kind of navigate what they're doing. And so um, someone said, I totally spaced out that the meeting was today. So I think a reminder would help me. Uh, I still get distracted real bad. So she did help with the reminder. And so, you know, thinking about folks, young people, even as they're exiting exploitation and they've been out of exploitation, they've already accessed services. Um, they are likely still system involved and still have a ton of obligations. And so um, really honing in on what their needs are, identifying them and then meeting those needs. like through a text message reminder. Here we have our enrollment flyer. And I do wanna note something we learned early on was that we don't have recruitment, recruitment flyers for this population, we have enrollment flyers. And a service provider said early on, you know, traffickers recruit kids, researchers enroll, like let's enroll kids into studies, let's not recruit them. And so it's really small but it is a trauma-informed way of really, you know, understanding that if they hear the word recruitment, they might have an adverse reaction. And so we have our in, uh, enrollment flyer and uh, the uh, inclusion criteria included identifying as a girl or female between the ages of 13 and 21, have histories of exploitation and system involvement, um, and youth really have the opportunity to earn a lot of money. So it was up to $370. They uh, earned money essentially every time we met, every time that they had completed a quiz, um, every time they did the pre-test or post-test follow-ups, there was an opportunity to just incentivize them a little bit more. Um, and also there were a ton of prizes that were, you know, available also as we were going through the intervention. So here's an overview of our study timeline. We assented the youth or consented based on their age. Uh, we had the intervention and at baseline, we also did a pretest. Uh, we had a one month follow up and a three month follow up. And so intermittently between these follow-ups, youth were also receiving text messages from us. So it was either brief kind of factoids of some of the content that we had talked about within the intervention or re retention quizzes. Um, and I think it's really interesting that, you know, in prior work that we've done and even the youth advisory board, they emphasized they wanted to hear from us. 
they did want to receive text messages, like not every day, but they wanted a message that was an encouraging quote every now and then, or something that, you know, they didn't mind receiving health related information if they knew that they had just participated um, in the intervention. And so I think, you know, thinking about the attention sometimes that you require and giving that attention in a way that's positive and healthy, I think is, is really critical. Remember Sarah, one of them uh, coined the term empowerment pop-ups. So they yes. wanted sort of like affirmative shout outs. Um, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. Yeah. And I, you know, I think that speaks to how clever these, these youth are also. They're like, yeah, send me an empowerment pop-up. Like, let's see it. And tell me happy birthday and send me a gift card. Um, <laughs> but I think that that's kind of the fun of it um, and the interactive nature. So the My Body, My Choice components here, we have kind of setting the foundation of what the goals are and really what adolescent sexuality and health is, um, providing some knowledge on you know, STI prevention, transmission, teen pregnancy, um, addressing attitudes and beliefs that you hold and also um, addressing kind of the skills and self-efficacy. So one thing that I think was really great is the negotiation refusal skills, which oftentimes youth who are, are exploited um, don't necessarily or don't always have agency to negotiate sex. And if they do, it's in often in commercial sexual exploitation uh, incidents, it's very different. And so, um, you know, kind of having conversations about the power and the agency that folks have, and then practicing what that looks like, I think was incredibly powerful. Um, so we use different techniques, brainstorming, role-playing, skill building, uh, discussions, videos, and games. Here are our measures, and I'll go over some of the findings in just a moment, um, but you know, really capturing knowledge, beliefs, behaviors, uh, and feasibility and likability. Next slide. Here is an overview or just like a piece of the content. This is our anatomy content. Um, and so, you know, we try to make it fun, interactive, the slides, you know, multicultural. Um, so that it felt kind of inviting and welcoming and youth friendly. Here's an example of a weekly retention quiz. And these were built out with, uh, in the youth advisory boards, board meetings. So here we see a question pops up. The youth has the opportunity to answer true, false, I don't know. And one of the things to highlight is that the youth sort of helped us in all the design, the design, like it, the design templates really reflect the population that mm -hmm. we work with. And even some of the hashtags, we had yeah. a whole session on like coming up with what hashtags would be most uh, resonant um, and responsive, as well as uh, different gifts and memes. So we didn't sort of arbitrarily uh, choose some of these. Yeah, exactly. So these were definitely youth centered, youth built. Um, and it was interesting that they actually wanted to receive quizzes. You know, we thought it might be too much to do a quiz and a post test and a post test, um, but they were excited about it. And they were especially excited if they felt like there would be an incentive that could go along with that. And it's not like they were asking for a lot of money, but I think it, it's fair that if we're going to inter interface with them, ask them some questions, uh, that they are compensated in some way. So here we see just examples of the reminders, uh, reminder text messages. So reminder, you can get free condoms at your local health healthcare clinic. Uh, reminder, no matter what comes your way, you can get through it. You got this, trust yourself. Um, and it was really great, I think, also partnering with Alta Med, which provided, you know, some information of where they could go in their locality to actually access uh, condoms and health services and low cost and no cost. 
here's the implementation. So we did two rounds in the first round. We, it was over the period of three weeks. Um, we were working out some kinks. And so we added a couple days um, to really kind of get through the content. And that included uh, five lived experience experts who were co-facilitating with two healthcare educators from Alta Med. And there was 21 youth in the groups. Uh, the second round, we had four lived experience experts, two healthcare professionals, and 16 youth uh, participating. And these took place in, during the week. In the evenings, we gave them about maybe an hour, an hour and a half after school was out. Um, so it was enough time that they could take a break, um, but also, you know, still kind of be present. And we wanted to make sure that we weren't interrupting any meal time that might occur at their respective group home or their place of setting. So we wanted to do it before their dinner time. So some of the findings, um, in total, 37 youth were enrolled. The mean age of youth was 16.43 years old. Um, at the completed one month questionnaire, 35 youth had completed it. Two youth did not complete it because they were, um, away without approved lead. So they, they'd run away from care um, and had an, an active bench worn out for them. And then there was at the three month follow-up, 100% um, retention you see at the three month, but also across the board for round two um, and a slight drop off, but it's still just over 80% of the youth uh, had completed all questionnaires for both rounds. Um, the majority identified as Latinx or Black or African American, um, but we see kind of a mix of racial groups here. Um, and all of the youth participating were um, systems involved in child welfare and or juvenile justice system. So this really highlights um, what the their understanding of some of the core concepts were. So it's only a snapshot of our result, but we see here that there were only two, uh, well, there are only two statistically significant results on the understanding concepts. It is important to note that the findings are predominantly trending, trending in the right direction. So youth are showing an increased understanding of the concepts. Uh, in addition, at baseline, most questions had a majority of correct answers. So like, I think 60%, about 50 to 60%. Um, and so I think that's really promising that folks do have some level of knowledge coming into the intervention, um, which kind of acted as a primer in some cases. And then we were building on that. Um, here at baseline, we see that youth are still engaging in high sex or high risk sex. Um, and there's, you know, this is one example um, of the disconnect between their desire and want to avoid contracting STIs, HIV, and being pregnant, but uh, they're not necessarily practicing safe sex behaviors. And it was really great to see that uh, the feasibility and acceptability of this intervention uh, here, the highlighted are really the 100% for round two of yeses and 80 to 90% to 100% in the round one of yeses to if they found it um, likable, feasible, acceptable. And so, um, you know, for example, 100% of participants in round two agreed or strongly agreed that they think they would like to access this course frequently um, and that they liked facilitators facilitating uh, that were survivor leaders. Um, so overall, we'll just say, you know, youth's knowledge retention did seem to increase. Uh, there was a high percentage of youth who had never used birth control for anal sex, which was really interesting. Um, and really as an iterative process can inform around the next round. Um, success from the feasibility, acceptability and likability point of view, um, youth really seem to enjoy the intervention and we had a really high retention rate. And so we were really you know, excited that even as these youth 
our system involved and sometimes changing placements very quickly, um, youth were still excited to come back to it. And you know, the 100% retention rate, I think really speaks to using a community engaged process and creating and cultivating relationships with folks with lived experience. I think that was something that um, should be noted. Well, and I think people assume that because of their transients and system involvement that there's gonna be high dropout and that's not, that doesn't have to be true. You know, and, right. you know. And I will say, I think it also speaks to earlier work we did where folks said, you know, we want things online and this was pre-pandemic. Um, they wanted things already to be accessible online. It was accessible online. They can log in um, and be present. And so I think the barrier of transportation might have helped uh, in some way as well. Um, but of course, it was a small sample size. Uh, we had a lot of, um, it took a lot of time to really obtain the court approval to um, do this study. And so, um, you know, it's not without limitations and challenges, but I do think, as I said, you know, these are things that we could just keep in mind for future iterations, being mindful of Zoom fatigue, um, you know, trying to track folks engagement in the curriculum um, and just taking time to remind youth of Zoom features and, you know, building the relationships I think are incredibly important. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna go through this. Uh, this is a, I think a preview to the paper that we have coming out, um, but there were some lessons learned when it comes to kind of youth in particular. And I know this will be available at a later time. So maybe come back and take a look. Um, here are our next steps, which we'll go through uh, just very quickly. You know, we're develop, co-developing manuscripts with folks with lived experience, community members. Um, and really the next step is to circle back with our stakeholders and continue the dissemination and brainstorm how to keep moving forward. Thank you. Fantastic. Wow, thank you so much. This is really terrific, amazing work. Uh, so we do have a couple of, of minutes for questions and comments from our community. Thank you again for, for an amazing presentation and such important work. Uh, I see a hand, uh, Alpna Agrawal, it's all yours. Hi, um, thank you so much for the talk. I mean, this it was really incredible. Um, I was curious um, about the data you had presented on the possible disconnect on sec you know between the program and sexual behavior and I wonder if there is a disconnect like I didn't know if you had an opportunity to assess like you know their um, sexual self-efficacy following the program like other measures um, like that the, their sexual uh, negotiation skills their sexual um, yeah, like whether their norms changed, any any of those validated scales. I was just curious um, because I wonder if the program had an impact at that level and maybe there wasn't a disconnect per se. Thank you. Yes, yes, so thanks for that question. Uh, yes, so that we do have that and we, we, I think in the interest of time, we didn't show all the results, but there was a disconnect. And, you know, my understanding is attitudes and beliefs, the gulf between that impacting behavior can be huge. And that's what we're seeing. There is this sort of disconnect between their beliefs around not wanting to be pregnant or just even understanding certain concepts and then actually what they are doing. And so I think in future iterations is how to sort of, how do we get behavioral change? But I mean, most of our, if we just look, zoom out and think about um, behavioral interventions in general, behavior is the hardest to change despite attitudes and beliefs. And this is just one sort of uh, snapshot, but that is, that is something that we noticed um, a gap. And really, I think our goal, because this was a K award, basically, 
was to see like, is this feasible and acceptable? Can we engage the population, sustain them in the study? Like we have to pivot to Zoom. Are they able to use the technology in a way that feels facile? Um, and really when we can scale up to have a bigger population, those of, you know, understanding the effects of those changes will be even more pronounced. But yes, the disconnect did exist. And this was just a snapshot of it, you know, looking at the anal sex in particular. Right, and just to clarify, um, I think I highlighted the baseline characteristics that there was this disconnect between um, wanting to not necessarily get an STI or HIV or get pregnant, um, but their behaviors are not um, congruent with that. And so that was at baseline. We did see like an improvement here where, um, you know, it's trending downward. So the number Somebody of folks- didn't answer also, <laughs> you know, right. what I mean? which is interesting too, right? Yeah. So more work to be done. We have a couple minutes left. Uh, Helena, you have a comment or question. Amazing work here, and I, I have two related questions. One is what I one thing that's striking is the way that you engaged youth with lived experience in designing this intervention, delivering it, and I'm wondering if in your contact with um, juvenile justice and foster care system officials and and health practitioners, the idea of more broadly involving people with lived experience as team members and as experts um, seem to catch on. Do, do you see the potential for that beyond the study? And then second, you also mentioned that there, there were many policies that were debated and changed in the course of the study that bear, that bear on this reproductive health for this group. And I wondered, did you, in the course of engaging the youth with lived experience, did the idea of you know, advocacy on their own behalf, getting involved on that level come up? Was that something that was appealing? Um, maybe we can both tag team, Sarah. Um, in the world of uh, commercial sexual exploitation, having survivor leaders or people with lived experience is the rule, not the exception. And so people like us without those histories are outliers and really not, we're not, we're barely invited to the party. And so that's good, you know? And so um, in terms of who's driving the agenda and I really learned a lot with humility about what the process was. And so um, that really, I think, I think that format should be adopted in other areas. So people doing work with you know, uh, people who have experienced child welfare placement or juvenile justice involvement, our population often experiences all those systems together. Um, but yes, that seems to be the uh, rule, not the exception, and also having advocates as well. So not only lived experience experts, but people who function as advocates as part of a multidisciplinary team. We can't take any credit for any of the policies, although one of my close friends and colleagues, Liz Barnard, um, who's on faculty here in pediatrics. Uh, she was really instrumental in bringing safe harbor legislation to uh, California. And that legislation is really important as part of the overall decriminalization efforts uh, for youth because really it's the child rapist who should be um, receiving the most penalties and legal sanctions, not the youth. So historically, youth would get in trouble, they would get picked up on the street, they would get incarcerated and not the person purchasing sex, right? And so part of Safe Harbor legislation was not only to invert that and really treat uh, commercial sexual exploitation as a child maltreatment, child welfare issue, but really to um, start marshalling services for this population. And I think the change that we can sort of take a little credit for was in the Star Court, um, Judge Pratt actually ended up hiring a public health nurse. And so that I think is hopefully something that court systems will do because I do feel um, that this nexus between sex, 
uh, mental health and substance use needs to be brought forward and centered. And the courts don't seem to care about reproductive health in the same way, but they should center it with the same sort of vigor and intensity that they um, make available uh, mental health and substance use services for this population. Developmentally, it makes sense. And if we look just from a public health point of view, like who's bearing the brunt of STI burden and unintended pregnancies and what are the un unintended sequelae of those actions, so. Thank you, amazing work. I know we're out of time, but anything to add to that, Sarah, before we say goodbye? No, thank you all for your time. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Really, Thanks for having us. work. Thanks, everyone. Have a good weekend and see you next time.